my foot got trapped in it, and then I did like a backflip off of it and broke my foot. I think we were feeding our birds one time, and they never knew that the cave was haunted. But I found it and tried to give it to her, but she said no. It's time for the apple seed. In every episode of the show, we listen to great storytellers tell great stories. And we always hope that the stories we bring you spark memories and thoughts for you that you can share with the people that you love around the kitchen table or the living room. That kind of storytelling can entertain, inspire, and strengthen you and your family. I'm your host, Sam Payne. And we often say on the show that we bring you all kinds of tales from all kinds of tellers. You've probably heard us say it. Well, on today's show, we're not only going to do that, but we'll also highlight different ways to tell a tale. Not all the ways, of course, that there are to tell a story, but we'll hit at least three or four. And our first story comes from Antonio Sacre. And, of course, is part of the tradition that's dearest to the heart of the apple seed, telling stories in front of a terrific audience. Antonio, of course, comes from a Cuban background and an Irish background, and he's based in Los Angeles. And you'd think that a professional storyteller like Antonio would have no trouble telling bedtime stories to his own kids. But as our first story will show, that's not always the case. But I come home from telling stories all day long, six hours of storytelling in a school, and I sometimes can't tell stories to my own children. Just a moment from the story, How Not to Tell Stories to Your Own Kids, from storyteller Antonio Sacre. And if you stick around to the end of the story, you'll hear a telling of a classic fairy tale that perhaps doesn't go quite the way you remember it. And after Antonio Sacre, we'll bring you a story that's about both written and visual storytelling and the way those two forms can enhance each other. It's a conversation with an author who felt she had a great story to share with the world, but she struggled to find her voice as a writer. But when she started to pair her written words with her own drawings, well, that's when it all started to click. I discovered a skill where I was able to capture expressions, um, faces. For me, that just became so clear to the message I was, I've been trying to like share and the feelings that I want to share with my stories. That's Ingrid Ochoa, the author and artist behind the popular internet comic, The Kiss Bet. And we'll bring you a conversation with Ingrid a little later in the hour. And finally, we'll end with a short musical story, like our first story. This one takes place at bedtime. But instead of bedtime stories, this one is about bedtime songs. Secret fighter, running on the ground and climbing in the trees. (laughs) <laughs> a story from my own life coming up this hour on the apple seat. And now, how about we get started? Antonio Sacre waiting with a story called How Not to Tell Stories to Your Own Kids. And that may sound like odd advice coming from a storyteller, but trust us, your whole family is going to love this performance from Antonio. Let's head off to the apple seed studio along with our terrific studio audience. Away we go. <laughs> Back to the microphone, ladies and gentlemen, with a round of applause, Mr. Antonio Sacre. What a beautiful song. Thank you. So I make a living telling stories. My dad can't believe this. I talk to my dad very often, almost every day, and he always says, eh, not always, but every now and then he says, mijo, it's amazing you make a living as a storyteller because you are like the 10th best storyteller in our family. <laughs> Which sounds like an insult, but if I were to go through the top nine, it's, a, it's, a, like a, it's a Bronx Bombers list. It's amazing. So top 10 in my family is pretty good. Um, and part of, part of what I do is I do a lot of work with teachers and parents. It, what the apple seed does. Here's a story. Does that spark a memory? Go home and share those memories. And I told Sam today earlier, it's a folk art. It's not a fine art. You guys are fine artists. You have worked thousands of hours to do this thing that you do. And maybe if I practiced a thousand hours, I would never sound like that. But still, it's different. But folk art, storytelling, we all do it. 
And so I, I, when, as I've been working with teachers and understanding the power of story, I then had children. <laughs> and it's an odd thing. I tell parents to tell stories to their children every night. Of course, we read all the time. But I come home from telling stories all day long, six hours of storytelling in a school. And I sometimes can't tell stories to my own children. <laughs> the old proverb, in the shoemaker's house, shoeless children. And I realized that this was something I was going to change. So when my son was two years old, one and a half years old, before my daughter was born, every night, the same routine, tuck him into bed, his little teddy bear, uh, reading a story, and then telling him a story. When he was younger, that worked OK, because I could tell the same story over and over again. I could tell the barking mouse 50 different times. When he was about four years old, he's like, Dad, I've heard that story before. <laughs> That's OK. I got plenty of stories. And I would go through my entire repertoire. So it took me a long time to get to the end of my repertoire, five or 10 minutes at a time, every night with my son. Until finally, now I was telling stories to my, my son was five, my daughter was two. And I would tell stories to both of them. And then my son would say, Dad, Tell me a story I haven't heard before. <laughs> so this got me going through all of the family members. And I have a lot of family members. So a little story about Cousin Maddie, and Cousin Marky, and Cousin Julie, and Uncle Mike, and Uncle Pat, and Tio Tito, and Tia Clara, and, and Ma Maria, all the way through until when he was about six years old, he said, Dad, tell me a story about that's true from your life that I haven't heard of ever before. And I'm like, honey, I'm at the end of my stories. Mm -hmm. And then I came across, working with some teachers, this quote from Albert Einstein, if you want your children to be smart, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more smart, well, he says, if you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. I love telling personal stories of my family from the two cultures, but then I began to realize there are a lot of fairy tales out there. And there would be a time when I would never, I don't think there's a t way you can run out of reading fairy tales. So I began to go through the fairy tales. And then sometimes my, I, would, I would sort of read or sort of learn the stories, and my, I would collapse into bed next to one of my children, and my daughter would always say, no, dad, stand up and tell stories. <laughs> so I peel myself out of the bed. She says, no, dad, do that thing you do when you're telling stories with your hands. <laughs> so I, I'm like trying to perform at 8 o'clock at night for my kids doing the thing, collapsing in bed again. And I began reading the grim fairy tales. You know many of these stories. Who's ever heard of Cinderella? Who's heard of Rumpelstiltskin? Who's heard of, you know, Hansel and Gretel? Who knows the original version from the actual Grimm stories? <laughs> now, the na their name is Grimm. Their last name is Grimm. And the original versions are also Grimm. So I didn't read the stories first before I was reading stories to my children until I'm trying to edit on the fly as we're going along. <laughs> and now my son is old enough. He's now 10, where he wants the original Grimm fairy tale versions. And I found them in Spanish, so we read them in Spanish. And that led me to. Who is the grim fairy tale brothers of Spain and Cuba and Mexico? And I'm finding these old resources, and we're reading these stories at night. So one of the stories I want to share with you is the very first story in the Grimm's collection that I have. You probably know it. I'm going to tell it as close to the original as I can and still have it suitable for family audiences. <laughs> there once, a long time ago, when wishing still was worth something, a king, a queen, and three children. And the youngest girl delighted in playing with a golden ball. How was it golden? I don't know. It's a fairy tale. But she would take that golden ball, and she would see her reflection in it. And then, as she got older, she learned how to throw it in the air and catch it, and then throw it higher and catch it, and throw it and do spins and catch it and do cartwheels. It was the delight of her days. Not too far from the castle, there was a forest, a deep dark forest. And one day, as she was playing with the ball, the ball, she dropped it, it started to roll, and it rolled directly into the forest. But that girl was not letting her favorite golden ball get away. And into the forest she went, following that ball, until she heard splash. Golden ball went down into a well or a pond. And she sat there, and she started crying and crying. And out of that well came the most hideous frog, splat looked up at the girl. Why are you crying? She said, you're a frog that talks. I'm a magic talking frog. I can get that ball for you. She said, 
You can. Thank you, magic talking frog. <laughs> what will you give me if I get it? Oh, frog, I will give you whatever you want. I will give you jewels. I'm a frog. I don't need jewels. I will give you uh, uh, clothes to wear, the finest silk. I'm a frog. I don't need silk. What will you give me? Whatever you wish. I wish to be the royal frog pet. I want to live in the castle. I want to eat at your table. I want to sleep in your bed. And the princess said, of course, frog. And down into the pond, and up came the ball. And the girl took that ball. And not her first mistake, but her worst mistake, she said goodbye, frog, and ran as fast as her strong legs could take her back to the castle, slammed the door, and sat down to a sumptuous meal with her father, the king, her mother, the queen, and the royal siblings. As they were eating, there was a sound. Horrible. Plop. 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 And somehow that frog knocked on the door. <laughs> it's a fairy tale, so <laughs> knock, knock. Or I guess it'd be like splat, splat, splat. And the king said, did you hear that? And the daughter said, I heard nothing. And the queen said, there is a knock at the door. Young daughter, go see who is at the door. She went, she knew what was there, opened the door, looked down and said, Frog, I am here for you to complete your promise to me. No, slammed the door on the frog back to the table. And the queen said, who was there? And the daughter answered truthfully, there was nobody there. <laughs> Not any person, mom. Okay, they sat down, went splat, splat, splat. Go and see who it is. There is no person there. And mother, the mother, the queen said, I will find it. She goes to the door. She opens it up. She looks out. She doesn't see anything. She comes back. Our daughter was telling the truth, king. There is nobody there. They're eating their meal again when splat, splat. And the king goes and he looks and he hears down here, king. And he looks at the frog. Ah, a magic talking frog. Yes, your daughter promised me something, and she will not keep her promise. What was the promise? I helped her find her golden ball. Oh, her golden ball, her favorite toy. And she said, I could be the royal pet. My daughter promised that. Yes, then you will be the royal pet. And in came the frog, splop, splop next to the table, plop, on the table, next to her plate, splop. He said, daughter, I will now eat from your plate. And that frog, <laughs> and she was so disgusted, she could not eat anymore. He said, I am full. I will now take a nap in your bed. She said, you will not. And the father said, what you asked and what you promised must be completed. Come, frog. The frog slatted up the steps on to the royal bed, splat. And she looked at it and he said, I will now have your pillow. She said, you will not frog. And this is where it turns a little bit. It ends up okay, but I just want you to not freak out. <laughs> so it's okay. okay. She grabs that frog. You've heard the version where she kisses the frog. The original version, she takes that frog and splats it against the wall and she there's frog goo everywhere. It starts to slide down in a horrible mess. And when that bloody mess touches the ground, out comes a beautiful boy. <laughs> and he looks at her. And she looks at him. And they lived. And this is how it says in the book, happily until they died. <laughs> A story from Antonio Sacre called How Not to Tell Stories to Your Own Kids. That story was a lot of fun, and it's always a little amusing to find out that some of our favorite fairy tales originally took a more gruesome turn. But on a more serious note, I think Antonio really put his finger on a tricky tension that can exist when sharing stories with young people. Frankly, some stories, like the stories of the Brothers Grimm, are a whole lot messier than maybe we'd like them to be, or maybe than we thought they were. And it's much easier to tell a kid the version where the princess kisses the frog instead of splatting it against the wall, <laughs> a version that might be a little kinder or gentler. And I can think of other stories that can get a little difficult once you start to unpack them. The story of Noah's Ark, for example. That's a favorite, right? All those colorful animals marching two by two onto a giant boat, beautiful rainbow at the end. 
And what about the stuff in between, the part where God wipes away most of the people on the earth in an all-consuming flood? That may be heavy stuff for a kid or for a grown-up, for that matter. And the story does end, of course, with a moment of mercy, a promise from God that he'll never flood the earth again. But you have to acknowledge the destruction in order to get to the rainbow at the end. And like I said at the top of the show, we hope that the stories we share spark memories that you can share with people you love. And when those memories come, you may be tempted to leave out the parts that get a little complicated, especially if they show you in a less than flattering light. But you might think twice about that. If it's someone you love and you think they're mature enough, those complicated bits of stories might just open up conversations that will help draw you closer together. Or, you never know, they might even lead to a good laugh, like in the Antonio Sacre story we just heard. Some of those difficult bits of difficult stories are worth bringing to the storytelling table, too. And in just a moment, a little talk back with our producers, Heather and Brian, about that story of Antonio's, followed by the story of a woman who found her storytelling voice when she learned how to draw. That's coming up here on The Appleseed. I'm Sam Payne. ago, it was our pleasure to listen, along with our terrific uh, studio audience in the Appleseed Performance Studio, to a wonderful story from Antonio Sacre, a story called How Not to Tell Stories to Your Kids. Well, it's my pleasure to be joined around the desk by our producers, Dr. Brian Tanner, Dr. Heather Bigley, to chat a little bit about that story. Guys, it's great to have you with me. Hello. Hey, good to be here. Did this story bring back m- memories for you of... of- of either being told stories or telling stories? Or where did this story take you? It it did for me um, because, you know, there's this moment in the story where he's reading the grim fairy tales and realizing in real time, like, ugh. (laughs) 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 There's some stuff in here (laughs) that's a little tricky, you know. Um, It's true, you know, we have we 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 acquaint ourselves with a lot of these fairy tales through uh, Disney films and other things like that, or just when sanitized versions. When in Mm -hmm. in reality, the original versions of these stories are often darker, often a little trickier. Yeah, Yeah. and I found with my own kids as they're getting older, like it's so fun for me because it's like, okay, you're finally at the point where I can share some of my favorite things, my favorite movies, my favorite books, and stuff, and. but there have been times where I'm like, oh, I love this thing. Let's let's read it. It's great, you know. But I realize like, oh, maybe maybe this wasn't <laughs> age appropriate. For instance, um, I read the book Holes mm-hmm. with my son. Um, it's if it's a novel by Louis Sakar. Yeah. Um, kind of a modern classic in like the middle grade. Um, level when he was probably about eight years old. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh, this is a fun story about these kids in the desert and there's kind of a mystery and the past and the present are kind of intertwining in cool ways. But as we were reading it, I was like, I'd completely forgotten how much like racial tension is brought into the story. And there's talks about lynchings and things. And I was like, wow, this is this is kind of tricky stuff, you know? And and I was like, how much do I just kind of like, well, let's just gloss over this and speed past it. Or how much do we actually stop and kind of unpack some of this stuff? And I decided, like, let's let's kind of unpack this. I mean, like, it, it, there's, a, there's a way to talk about lynchings at an adult level, and there's a way to do it at an eight, eight-year-old level. But, you know, so, so maybe I wasn't as you know, explicit as you might be with an adult, but it was just kind of like, let's let's talk about how complicated race can be and, and how how this history is is really kind of ugly at times. Yeah. And I feel like it was it was a good moment to um in a friendly home environment being being where where I can be a part of it and knowing what my kid is <laughs> yeah. experiencing to to kind of approach these topics for the first time. It ended up being a good thing. Yeah. So having gone down that path, having entered into that difficult conversation, you don't find yourself wishing you'd gone the other way. No, I don't. I I do think that we had a good conversation then, and it kind of showed me that I uh, don't need to shy away 
from hard things all the time. In fact, yeah. there there can be a time and place where we can talk about those things. So uh, I, I mentioned the racial stuff in the book, but it's led to other conversations about other kinds of topics about people who may be different from him and how, yeah. and how to treat them well. Mm-hmm. You know, we've had talks about how to treat LGBTQ people or people with, like, different abilities or people who are neurodivergent. Um, You know, recently I actually got an official diagnosis for ADHD, Hmm. you know, and it was was kind of a thing where it was like, what, do I need to tell my kids about this or not? Or, you know, but it was just like, no, this is a good chance to say, like, this is— I'm your I'm your dad, and this is something that I'm struggling with. And there may be other people in your life too. There may be friends at school, and so let's just be let's just be kind and considerate yeah. to other people because they they may be having a different experience than you. And you've set a precedent for not shying away from conversations that may be a little bit difficult. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How about you, Heather? Where well, did we take you. Um, I was thinking about being in German class and reading these uh, tales in German, and uh, how shocking they were. Uh, at first, and not because I couldn't handle the material, but culturally speaking, you know, the you know, for instance, the Germans have this character, the Scissor Man, that's going to come and uh, get you if you don't behave. And I just thought, what's it like to grow up in a culture where the Scissor Man exists? Right? What else? Uh, what else is in that culture? <laughs> yeah. Um, and not to point fingers at the Germans, but of course, we have in our culture similar kinds of things, you know. We have the boogeyman and and we, you know, so what is what does that say about us that that's how we want to, you know, instruct our children, right, that we have a creature that will come and get you. And I don't think we do that much anymore, but certainly it was around when I was growing up. Using fear as a motivator. <laughs> yeah, and not just like fear of, um, the fear of doing wrong, but the fear that some horrible monster is coming to get, coming you. to get you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah we, I look at uh, kind of old world Christmas traditions and it's full of stuff like that. You know, critters that will come to your house. Krampus. Krampus. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of the, of, uh, now I can't remember what they're called, but they come to your house and if your house isn't clean, they cut you open and fill it with the dust that they sweep from your house. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you better watch out. Right. You, you, you better not cry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 again, I'm I'm very interested in the notion of you know getting down into some of these uh, difficult folk tales, right? As a parallel for you know what Brian was talking about, not shying away from some of the stuff. You know, we look at the child next to us and we think. Is this child ready to engage with some difficult topics? Yeah. And Brian, mm-hmm. your choice was to move forward in a way, you know, as the child's father, uh, knowing the child, having some experience with the topic, and being able to appropriately lead a child into a discussion that will enrich their understanding. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, the story from Antonio Sacre did bring back a memory for me that I'd like to share as today's entry in the Radio Family Journal. The Radio Family Journal with Sam Payne. A tiny little story for you and your family. Right when you need it. On the Appleseed. I remember as a little kid sitting down to a television event that no one who saw it would ever forget. It wasn't the moon landing or a royal wedding. It wasn't a bowl game. At the center of the event was actually a death, the death of a guy named Will Lee. Now, I don't know how many people would remember the name Will Lee. When he died in 1982, I don't think I even knew him by that name, but Will Lee's passing became an event of more than passing interest to every little kid in America because every little kid in America knew him by another name, his TV name, Mr. Hooper. Mr. Hooper was the original owner of the neighborhood store on Sesame Street. We all loved Mr. Hooper as much as Big Bird did, which was a lot. 
when Bert secretly traded his paperclip collection to Mr. Hooper for a Christmas present to give to Ernie, a soap dish for Ernie to keep his rubber ducky in, and when Ernie secretly traded his rubber ducky to Mr. Hooper for a Christmas present for Bert, a cigar box for Bert to keep his paperclip collection in, Mr. Hooper showed up on Christmas morning with the paperclip collection and the rubber ducky as presents for the two friends, saving Christmas for Bert and Ernie even though Mr. Hooper, like Will Lee, who played the role, was Jewish. Mr. Hooper, the kindly, if only a little curmudgeonly old store owner at the center of so much of what went on in Sesame Street, was any little kid's superhero. And when Will Lee, the real-life actor who played Mr. Hooper, passed away, what was Sesame Street going to do? They could have simply replaced him with another actor. I mean, shows do that, right? They could have had a Mr. Hooper retired from the store and moved to Hawaii episode. That would have taken care of it, right? But the folks at the Children's Television Workshop, the producers of Sesame Street, said, no, passing from this life is a difficult subject to talk about with young kids, they said, but we're going to try to do it. Kids will deal with the passing away of important people in their lives, and helping kids manage the things that will happen to them, well, that's kind of what Sesame Street was for, so thought the producers of the show, as they sat down and tried to figure out how to tell a difficult story to their young audience. As they talked about the episode, it became important to them to communicate three things. Mr. Hooper has died, he's not coming back, and we all miss him and it became important to them to see that difficult idea through the eyes of a young child. And it became important to them to find a time to broadcast the episode when a lot of people would see it, and also when parents would be home from work and other activities and available to talk to their kids when those kids experienced the episode. Well... The episode, which broadcast on Thanksgiving Day, 1983, was called Goodbye, Mr. Hooper. And in it, Big Bird has to come to terms with the fact that Mr. Hooper is gone. And in one segment of the show, Big Bird has drawn pictures of all of his adult friends on Sesame Street, and he passes them all out, and they all love the pictures. And at the end of it all, Big Bird is left with one picture in his hand, a picture of Mr. Hooper. And he says that he can't wait for Mr. Hooper to see it and that he'll show it to him just as soon as he gets back. And Big Bird's friends have to explain gently to Big Bird that Mr. Hooper isn't coming back. And Big Bird says, but who's going to make my birdseed milkshakes? Who's going to tell me stories? And David, the Sesame Street grown-up to whom the store has been left, says, well, I'll make your milkshakes and we'll all tell you stories. We'll make sure you're okay. And Bob, the musician, says, It won't ever be the same without Mr. Hooper, but we can be glad we knew him and that we loved him a whole lot while he was here. The actor who plays Bob, the musician, says this through real-life tears. And Olivia, the photographer, says, And we will always have our memories. And Big Bird says, That's right. We can remember him and remember him and remember him as much as we want. Big Bird expresses sadness and anger and confusion, all the feelings that people feel when someone they loved was here and then isn't anymore. At the end of the episode, a new baby visits Sesame Street, and Big Bird is amazed and delighted, and he says, you know what the nice thing is about babies? One day they're not here, and the next day, here they are. Well, the episode won a Peabody Award. It was named by the Daytime Emmys as one of the ten most impactful moments in the history of daytime television. I watched the episode when it aired. Everybody did. Goodbye, Mr. Hooper was a television moment that with great care for the people who would see it, did what great stories can do, gave families the words to talk about the things, even the difficult things, that might happen to them. Things for which they might not have been able to find the words on their own. And of course, the lesson for all of us was that while sometimes we may stumble a bit when we need to talk about the important and difficult stories in our lives, 
it's always worth it. Filled with care and love and thoughtfulness for the audience with whom we'll share the story, to try. The Radio Family Journal of Sam Payne. A tiny little story for you and your family. Right when you need it, on the Appleseed. Thanks for joining me for that entry in the Radio Family Journal. You know, we always hope that the stories we bring you here on the show spark memories for you that you can share with the people that you love. That kind of sharing around the dinner table or the living room can make for memories that last a lifetime. A pleasure to sit around the desk with Heather and Brian to talk about that Antonio Sacre story. Heather, Brian, thanks so much for joining me. Hey, thank you. Thanks. Lots more coming up on The Appleseed. Thanks for joining us on The Appleseed today. We've already heard how not to tell stories to your kids, a tale from Antonio Sacre. And now we're going to switch gears and hear about a different kind of storyteller who tells her stories with words and pictures. Imagine it's your 18th birthday. You and your two best friends have been out celebrating all night, and now you're down in the subway station to catch a train home. And as you wait for the train... Your friends start giving you a hard time about the fact that you still haven't had your first kiss. The conversation is super embarrassing. And then out of nowhere, one of your friends dares you to do something you could never imagine doing. Kiss a stranger. Well, what do you do? Well, this is the opening scene of The Kiss Bet, an ongoing online comic that has built a loyal following since it debuted in 2019. The Kiss Bet is the work of this person. So my name is Ingrid Ochoa, and I'm an illustrator, and I love writing and creating stories. Ingrid is originally from Mexico, but she now lives in the United States. And she just introduced herself first as an illustrator. So you may think that she's always had a great gift for drawing. But that's not what she says. I've always loved drawing since I was really, really young. I wasn't always very good, but I always kind of was drawn to it. Even though she enjoyed drawing, it wasn't the thing that was driving her to become a storyteller. So if it wasn't drawing... What was it? In my heart, there has always been this passion for writing. And it kind of has always felt like a calling to me. Like I came here so that I can do this. And it's so interesting for me to think from a very, very young age, I've always felt like that. And I've always felt very, very strongly about doing this someday. Well, this intense love of writing as a young person was fueled by a feeling that Ingrid was carrying around stories inside of her, stories that had to be let out into the world. And I've always felt like before I die, this needs to be written. You know, whatever I want to write, something needs to be put down. And although Ingrid had stories to tell, she struggled to find just the right way to tell them. I was trying to find different methods and different mediums for me to tell my stories. I I tried writing books. I even had a typewriter where I would type all my stuff in there. And I even uh, would do short films with my friends so that I could tell my stories and bring them to life. And everything always just felt like I wasn't capturing like what I wanted to. Ingrid told us that the kinds of stories she was envisioning in her head were influenced by a lot of comic books and cartoons, especially ones from Japan. And it was her love of cartoons that led her to rediscover her love of drawing. I mean, I say I've always loved drawing, but to be honest, I never thought of me as a drawing artist person until I remember the day I was I was 17 years old. And me and my brother were always kind of like competing with each other and like, oh, I'm better at this than you, right? And I used to watch so many cartoons. And for some reason, he said like a funny thing to me. And he was like, oh, 
you watch too many cartoons, you can't even draw them. Like, why are you wasting your time? And I was like, I'm going to prove you wrong. And I literally ran into my room and grabbed a drawing of one of my favorite animes at the time. And I copied it side by side. And I was like, this looks exactly the same. I just discovered a new power that I literally never have tried doing this before in my life. And just like in a comic book origin story, once Ingrid discovered her new power, she focused on training. I need to do everything I can now to develop it and to make it better. And I I got really good at it because I put in all the effort. And as she got better and better at drawing, she found that her newfound ability was the key that could unlock the stories she had previously been unable to create through writing alone. For me, the images speak so much more than just like explaining things. And what, what, it's different for everyone. Some some writers are really good and they can do a really good job doing that. I can't. But for me, I discovered a skill where I was able to capture expressions, um, faces and feelings with, you know, lighting and mood and color. For me, that just became so clear to the message I was, I've been trying to like share and the feelings that I want to share with my stories. But that's probably one of my most favorite parts of storytelling is being able to convey those little feelings and like the expressions on the faces and just like a little blush or a little, you know, surprise. And, and I, I do that a lot in my stories because it's, I think it's so cute and so fun. So now that Ingrid had discovered the power of pairing her words with her drawings, she needed to find the right story to tell. And she found inspiration for both the characters and the direction of the story from her friends. My best friends were very much like the characters in the story. Like I had my best guy friend, my best girlfriend, and we would do, we would play a lot of like their games and be like, oh, I bet you wouldn't do this. I bet you wouldn't do, you know, it's a bunch of things like that. And so all those feelings, I would put them into my story because I, Every time I'm feeling things, I I I feel like there's other people that can relate to it. And so I just wanted to pull those relatable things into the story. So that's how it kind of started, you know. And so the story of the kiss bet was born. She posted the first episode in 2019 on webtoons.com. And at first, the number of views was pretty small, but... Ingrid didn't mind. She was happy that she was finally putting one of her stories out into the world. When I started doing putting my work online, I never thought anyone would read it. <laughs> so it was a little bit kind of like putting it out into the void and putting my thoughts and feelings. And I just felt so comfortable like sharing that huge, not secret, but like intimate part of myself from my stories into the internet because... In my mind, I was like, nobody that I know is going to read this. (laughs) So I can just put it out there. And then my best friend, girlfriend, she she found out about the comic and she was like, oh, look, everyone, Ingrid is doing this. And I was like, no, they're going to read it and they're going to realize that they're them. And I was like, maybe they won't realize. Maybe they'll maybe they'll just think it's just made up. Right. And then they're like, this is me, isn't it? This is totally me. And I was like, oh, my gosh, no, no. But then, you know, it just came out and I was like, yeah, it's you. And to this point now, they are all very supportive of my work and they they love that they are a part of this and they, they love being like important in my life enough for me to write about them. But pretty soon, the number of readers started to climb and Ingrid could tell that her story was really resonating with people, just like she hoped that it would. I do get a lot of messages from young readers who are like, "That's I'm going through something like that right now. But a lot is people my age, I'm, I'm 32, and even older who say, oh, I just remember those feelings and it's so nostalgic. But Ingrid was also surprised to learn that her readership included people she never would have suspected. Um, even my mom, <laughs> she has a book club with some um, sisters in church and... 
I've never told the sister and, and she goes, let's read the kiss bed. I'm 78 years old and I read every week. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize I had readers of all ages. The kiss bet has continued to gain new followers and Ingrid has continued to release new episodes every week. And now after a few years, Ingrid's story has reached more people than she ever could have imagined. Right now, there's 1.3 million followers in the English language, and it's translated into a few different languages like Spanish, French, German. I think overall, with all of the subscribers, there's around maybe 3 million, which is so crazy and huge to me how, how much it's grown. And just grateful that people are interested in, in this story. And the kiss bet has not only struck a chord with readers, but Ingrid has received some recognition from the comics industry as well. In 2021, the kiss bet was nominated for an Eisner Award, which is like the Oscars of the comics world. But while the number of followers is impressive and the critical recognition is validating like crazy, Ingrid's hope is that her work will spark the same feelings in her readers that she got from the stories she loved when she was young. Growing up, I would read a lot, a lot of books, a lot of comics, and I always felt that connection when I would read those books. And I always felt very identified when I would go to my special place in those books. And that's always something that I've wanted to create as well. And, you know, a space where people can feel like they connect. And that, that's one of my key goals is to be able to have people connect and feel related. I was writing for myself to myself and, and trying to tell my story, right? And and now I, I had a point where I had to say, okay, who am I writing to now? Who am I writing for? I'm still in the process of trying to f like say, yeah, this I'm writing for myself, but I'm also writing for you guys now. <laughs> Maybe you are like Ingrid. You feel like you have stories that you want to tell, but you haven't quite found the right way to tell them. For Ingrid... She was finally able to tell her stories when she put her love of writing together with her newly developed drawing skills. As we wrapped up our conversation, I asked Ingrid what she would say to anyone who might be searching for a voice like she was. I would say keep learning and keep trying to teach yourself and keep reading and keep seeing how other people do it and, and don't give up. I think anyone can do anything that anyone wants to do. We just have to do it. And, and I don't know how more clear to say it, but just do it and don't be scared and just trust that it's going to be fun because that's why I did it. That's why I did everything is because I thought it was so fun. We'd like to thank Ingrid Ochoa for sharing her story. You can find new episodes of The Kiss Bet every week at webtoons.com. And now, one last story before we go. And it comes from, well, it comes from me. And as promised, it's a musical tale. And like our first story, it brings us back to bedtime. The performance we'll hear was recorded live. Here we go. <laughs> audience just about this size one time and there was a little girl sitting right about where you're sitting actually and 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 after the concert she came up to me and she stood right here at the edge of the stage she's about eight years old and she said i'm a songwriter too and i i and usually if somebody comes up to you and says i'm a songwriter too especially somebody as cute and little as that you you just want to kind of pat them on the head and say Keep on going, little songwriter. You know, it's, it's all going to be well. And, 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 but this little girl, she kind of had her arms folded and there was kind of this challenge in her eye. You know, she was like, she said it in such a way that made you want to go, oh, yeah. So, so I, I said, I said, well, sing me something you wrote then. And, and I, she didn't even have any instruments or anything like that. So in my mind, I was kind of going, take that, little songwriter. And she, and, and she, and she said, all right, I will sing you a, a song that I wrote. I'll sing you a song that I wrote yesterday on a hike with my mom and dad. And she sang this. Oh, up in the mountains, late at night, you can look and listen as hard as you might, but you won't hear the sound of the crickets tonight. You won't hear the sound of the 
crickets tonight For the crickets have left us Gone far, far away Oh, the crickets have left They left during the day As hard as I work As hard as I try I can't make the sound Of the crickets cry As hard as I work As hard as I try can't make the sound of the crickets cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and she looked up at me, and I, kind of speechless, looked down at her, and she said, now sing me one you wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and I could see in her eyes the take that songwriter man and I, I started to think of a song that I could sing for her and, and, and she said no I want to hear one that you wrote when you were my age <laughs> and I, I, I was a speechless for only a moment and then I said well I wrote too many songs when I was your age to remember any of them <laughs> and she said <laughs> I, I was a lie of course you know I mean I, I, I knew I could remember precisely the song that I had written when I was her age and I was not about to bring it to this contest right it was a song that me and my brother wrote my brother in those days was trying to win the heart of Jenny Wild Jenny Wild lived four houses up from us up the hill and, and he wanted to win her heart for good and for keeps and he was six years old and I was eight and Jenny was seven and so my brother and I knees and elbows got around a piece of paper and started to write a song for Jenny Wilde. And, and my brother was kind of the principal songwriter and I was the, you know, kind of the secondary songwriter, but write a word, get a third. So I wasn't really playing it at all. And we, we, we wrote the song and we walked it up to Jenny Wilde's house and knocked on her door and she came to the door and she opened the door and she said, Sam, Joe. And, and my brother stepped up and he stood up tall and he raised his chin and he closed his eyes and he sang the song and the song went... I love you, I'll marry you, I love you, I'll marry you, I love you, I'll marry you, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> Floated off the porch and went home. She grew up to marry somebody else. <laughs> yeah, they, did you say they usually do? Yeah, they... Well, I, 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 we were not good songwriters. We were not even good songwriters for our age. I mean, there are other people who write songs at that age that are really beautiful. I have a, a, a friend whose daughter uh, sang up from the back seat as they were driving along one time. The little girl sang. She was four years old, and she sang up from the back seat. She sang... I see snowflakes falling, snow is on the way, but God knows where I am, and Jesus is in this song. <laughs> But I, you know, that same girl has an older sister who made up an opera. She composed an opera as she was kind of going around the house doing her daily stuff. And, and the opera was called Love in a Dairy. And, and she was the female protagonist of the opera. The male protagonist of the opera was an imaginary person named Percy. Percy was short for person I'm going to marry. And, and she would sing, she would just sing. The, the opera consists, the plot of the opera revolved around the, the girl giving Percy a list of unaccomplishable tasks uh, to win her hand. And so the songs in the opera ran along the lines of, oh, and try it again and Percy imaginary though he was took off you know? 
and she is now a grown up and thoroughly unmitigatedly single, you know. Um, <laughs> I had a lot more success writing songs for kids, you know, for my own children, for example. And they, they weren't songs really for anybody to hear. You know, they were just songs I was writing for my own kids. My, my, I, I've got an eight-year-old now. When he was three, bedtime was song time. And he would ask for, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star or hush, little baby. And, and one night I got all ready and I said, what would you like to hear tonight? And he said, Dad, sing the Secret Fighter song. And there's no Secret Fighter song. So, so I did what, what you would do. I, I made up a song there on the spot and I sang, Secret Fighter, running on the ground and climbing in the trees. Secret Fighter, crawling on the hands and crawling on the knees. Secret Fighter, driving all around in a little yellow car. Secret Fighter, fighting on the ground and reaching for the stars. Dancing, secret fighter. So we secret fighter it up every night. And on about the fifth day, I realized that on that first day, he had not, in fact, been asking for a secret fighter, but incy wincy spider. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. In the end, I just quit the field and I said to the little songwriter, "Will you teach me that song, and we'll call it good." So I sing it just about everywhere I go. Uh, she's probably a grown up now, and I'm going to sing it in an audience for an audience sometime in which she is sitting, and she's going to, you know, sue me. But um, <laughs> thanks for joining us today on the Apple Seed, where great stories can change your family's world. Before we go, we wanted to say thank you to those of you who have taken time to send an email to this show or who have left us a thoughtful review on your favorite podcast platform. You can also engage with us on our social media channels. A listener named Raylene Culbertson sent us a note on Facebook that said, I love listening to the Appleseed. So refreshing and entertaining. Well, we sure appreciated hearing that. Thank you. Thank you, Raylene. You can be like Raylene, drop us a comment on our Facebook page, or you can send us an email at theappleseed at byu.edu. If you're listening through a podcast app, please rate us. Leave us a little review. It helps spread the word, and who knows, we might just read it here on the show. We're pleased and proud to be among the many shows in the BYU Radio family of programs. You can find this episode or any episode from our archive on the BYU Radio app, at byuradio.org slash Appleseed or by Googling the Appleseed podcast. I'm Sam Payne, and I can't wait to be with you again on the Appleseed. Appleseed.